local businesses work within the supply chain. So you can see we, at this moment in time, we've got 40% of the supply chain coming from the Midlands, um, rest of UK 27% and just 33% from overseas. And this is even more interesting because it does show you the supply chain that's being used for the vehicle. So you can see there are companies there that are diversifying, that are moving out of their standard um, production um, projects and moving into rail. So MP Aerospaces, um, you know, renowned for working on military vehicles. You've got AP um, Racing. They, racing cars but they're diversifying into rail so this is really exciting for the project that we've been able to achieve this with the scheme so now i'll talk a little bit about the track project so the linchpin of the project really is to to come up with a new form of track that doesn't re require deep excavation of the road so current tram systems uh, dig about 600 mil deep and as a result of that they have to move all the utilities equipment out of the way and that costs around nine million a kilometre so the idea with our project is that we come up with something that's shallow that can sit in the surface level of the of the top layer of the road um, and that it will be lightweight enough so that it doesn't impact on those utilities. So in order to achieve this, we're not, we're not working in silo here. We have got a utilities coordinator on the team and he liaises with the um, stats companies um, because obviously we need to work with them. We need to ex them to accept this product as we're developing it, not, not just that we present an end product and expect them to, uh, to accept it. So we started conversations back in 2018 with the um, utility companies and in principle they're really on board with this idea because actually it's not convenient for them at all to have to relay their network and rechange you know change all the plans the back back office plans of their network so th this part of the project is is perhaps the most challenging but it's the most exciting and if we're really you know, if we succeed in this, we'll have really created um, an innovative product, not just for the UK, but, but globally. So WMG, uh, through a long um, but um, really great procurement process, because we had some really strong bids come back, we, it was difficult to choose in the end, but we went with Ingerop and they've been in contract uh, since May this year. Obviously, the pandemic did put a little bit of a, um, a delay. In, but we managed to get into contract in May and we've been they've been working away coming up with design concepts and just last week we as a collective we agreed on a concept to take forward to the next stage so that will be going to detailed design now and by May we'll have a fully full detailed design of the track form and then we'll move into component testing. Now we're looking to make these significant costs, as you can see from the product, it will be in the vehicles, it will be in the utility diversions, in the preliminaries, uh, overhead continuary and the earthworks. Those are the areas where we expect to see significant cost savings. Once we've um, built the prototype vehicle and we've got a test track, so Dudley, we're working with Dudley Borough Council on, on their, their creating an innovation centre, which is currently under construction. And at this moment in time, they're laying the first test track, which is a standard kind of network rail um, ballast track. So the vehicle will move there in February and will undertake its performance um, testing, speed, endurance, and it will check for its um, corner um, manoeuvring ground corners. After that, we'll need to build a prototype of the new test track and carry out integrated system testing. So we, we have a plan for working with Dudley to create that. This is what the Innovation Centre will look like by the end of um, 21. Uh, so once we've, we've carried out the integrated system testing um, over the next few years and we're happy with the product, we'll then move to deliver a first route for Coventry. What we've been doing over the last few years is looking at, we've been doing a quite a few feasibility studies, looking at various route options. Um, some of you may have um, heard we, we've looked at routes out to the University of Warwick, but we've also been looking at the route out to the University Hospital. 
And it's been agreed that the first route will go to the university hospital because there's much more, there's much greater patronage demand, which um, intuitively you could see that from, you know, um, the residential areas that surround the hospital um, on the way into the city centre. So the plan at, at this moment is to start um, at the rail station, go to the city centre and then out to the hospital. And uh, funding um, permitting, we put an extension out to Anstey Park. Ultimately, though, we, we, we have a plan to develop a network of routes that connect the city centre to those strategic locations. So out to um, JL, you know, Jaguar Land Rover, to the new Kings Hill development, to the University of Warwick, Tower Hill, um, up to Coventry Arena and, and obviously linked to HS2. So this, this um, phase of works we expect to see starting to happen in 2024, but that is subject to um, going through Transport for Works Act order process, which is a legal requirement, and it is subject to securing further funding. So how will we make sure that this new mode of transport is fit for the new normal? I mean, we, we as a team, we've started to look at um, all aspects of how the uh, vehicle operates and what we need to do to maximise its efficiency in operation during a, um, a, a, another pandemic or in that post-pandemic world where people might be a bit sceptical about using public transport. So we know autonomy is, is crucial because not only does it enable more capacity within the vehicle, it also enables a larger fleet to be deployed and in a more cost effective way. And thereby having a larger fleet, you can reduce the crowding by offering a more frequent service. We're also looking at the way the air is circulated within the vehicle, looking at optimal ventilation to minimise the spread of bacteria. We're looking at materials to reduce infection spread, like the grab handles, as I previously mentioned. And we'll be aiming to make everything as contactless as possible through passenger information and ticketing. We've also thought about cleaners and, and how we might be able to, um, you know, be cost effective in the way that vehicles are cleaned regularly and, and stops and thinking about automated robotic cleaners. And a lot of these at the moment, they're ideas. And so if any of them have any innovative ideas that you'd like to bring to us for exploration, you know, there's always opportunities to put in joint bids um, to innovate UK or other grant funders. So please don't be shy. Just quick phasing and time frame um, for the project. So we're currently in the R&D phase and we expect that to last up until 20, the end of 2022 when we hope to have achieved um, proof of concept. So that will be the vehicle working on the new track form. The, the testing will continue after that, but between 22 and 24, we expect to enter the consenting and planning phase. So this is where we submit our Transport for Works Act order and the concept design for the first route. Once that's determined, we can then uh, enter into the build phase. So uh, current programme looks to be that we could start that in late 24, early 25, with an operational first section by the end of 2025, with a fair wind behind us. <laughs> So just to conclude then, I just want to make it very clear that, you know, we're not looking at Very Light Rail as a single solution that will solve all those um, climate change problems out there. It, it's, it's a solution that needs to work hand in hand with an integrated transport system. So Very Light Rail will be part of that, that future city where you'll see autonomous pods, electric scooters, electric um, taxis, electric buses, dynamic wireless charging, and all those other ex exciting transport modes that are being developed for fit for the future. So this slide just, just shows, uh, demonstrates how we would like Coventry to, to, what Coventry will offer in the future. So it's not just those various transport modes, it's also the smart and connected city with um, clever apps for parking and such. It will have that urban traffic management centre, will be able to offer mobility as a service, something that you can pick up on uh, an app on your phone and look, look to see what's the best mode for the journey that you're making. Everything will be integrated with um, ticketing that's um, cross-modal. 
Um, and, you know, we've got other exciting projects coming to the re region, like the Battery Industrialisation Centre, which will help us continue to develop the battery technology to make sure that we always use the latest and best technology that's available to us at that time. There's a very exciting future um, that, that that's in store for us, and it's really great to be part of that and be working on something that fits within this strategic vision for the city. I'll, I'll stop talking now and I'll switch my camera back on and um, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Thank you. Nicola. Um, um, just before we take questions, question. I'm just going to put a quick um, link in the chat function. Um, if people could just spend two minutes just filling in this very quick survey, there's only six multiple choice questions to just so we can understand uh, a little bit more about these webinars that we've been doing. It will take two minutes, so I'm just going to put that in there now and then we'll do the Q&A session with Nicola. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so we've got one. Uh, I've got one question coming in so far. Um, I think, yeah, from Benno Jones. Would you like to um, ask your question and mute yourself and ask your question to Nicola? Okay, thank you. Um, I, I saw the the diagram that showed, um, you know, the track form. So how, how deep do you have to excavate? Because that was a bit unclear to me. I maybe missed it. But. No, sorry. Um, yes, yeah, so we're targeting 300 mil, but clearly we are in the R&D phase. Um, and whilst we have a concept that um, demonstrates that that could be achieved, um, clearly the R&D phase will, will obtain if that's possible or not. But 300 mil is the target depth. And if you had a service, you know, a pipe or something that was just 300 mil deep, would you have to move that? How 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 much below that can you still have utilities? Because it's a lightweight track form and, and, and vehicle, actually the damage to those utilities is is the risk. The, the damage can come from heavy goods vehicles rather than actually the very light rail system. So. Um, our vehicle is lighter than a bus. Um, it's actually shorter than a bus as well at only 11 metres. So in theory, um, there shouldn't be damage caused to utilities by the very light rail system. Having said that, we are undertaking um, survey work, um, looking at various route options, and we are keen to make sure that we don't hit any major utilities junctions. Um, you know, so, so we are taking that into consideration as we develop the route, the first route, um, and if we can avoid um, certain roads which have high um, utilities at a low um, depth in the road, then we would consider alternative options to avoid potentially sticky situations. Okay, it's just that nine million pounds per kilometre cost of the traditional method how much of that do you think you could save? Because yeah. presumably you still have to do some some things. Yeah, we're looking to reduce that to um, to around one to two million per kilometre, because, okay. like you've said, you know there will be areas we can't be naive um, that we won't have any utilities issues. But the aim is to absolutely minimise that conflict with utilities. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next question is from Hugo Singh. Hugo? Hi there. Um, the Hi. question I've got is, um, how are you looking to create the energy and electricity needed to power the very, le very light rail system? And are you looking into renewable energy options for that? Yes, the simple answer is yes. I mean, I'm working with Shamla on looking at um, uh, innovative hub. 
Um, we're looking at solar farms. We're looking at how the um, council could regenerate its own um, electricity for use by the um, very light rail vehicle. It's very much on our radar and it is something that we are, we, we would like to achieve. We would like the energy to come from 100% renewable sources. So that, okay. that's the plan. Great, thanks. Thank you. Um, we have a question um, from Avalyn. Hello. Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, just a question in regards to the vehicle design. Uh, do, do, the, do the vehicles like connect to form one larger vehicle with greater capacity? Because Coventry's um, fleet of buses fits around 70 travellers and Sheffield Tram, for example, fits about 200. So at a capacity of only 50 for the VLR, do you not risk requiring like a really large fleet? And yeah, so remember that we're we're a lot smaller city than other cities that have tram systems. We are only 350,000, but we have thought of that. So when we looked at the early feasibility studies, we did look at a longer vehicle versus a shorter vehicle. Um, what we can do, I mean, in a post-pandemic world, the likelihood is that we won't have the peaks in travel demand as we experienced pre-COVID. Um, there's not many people, you know, there's 25% of the population that used to work in an office that are now working from home. Um, and we expect that travel demand will be more spread in the future across the day. But what pre-COVID, what we had assumed was that if you needed extra capacity, you would just run one vehicle behind the other. So we very much are thinking ahead to autonomy when we'll be able, they, they can't be coupled there's no joining mechanism, but you can run one behind the other. And our ultimate um, aspiration is to have a high frequency service. So in other cities, um, the tram is often timetabled and they run on like 10 minutes and therefore you need the additional capacity. But if we're looking at five minute frequency, that peak demand is spread and you don't get the same um, crowding. So that's what we're working towards, high frequency service um, and a future in which you won't have, you know, peak travel in the way that we experienced it pre-COVID. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any more questions? Anyone have any more questions? I can see. Or, um, yeah. That gentleman just asked his question. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Nick. Hello, Nick. You've got a question for Nicola. Oh, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, that's very interesting. Thank you. Um, um, yeah. So I joined. Um, you, you, you were saying that that feasibility or the feasibility study for the route has already been undertaken. Um, so I was wondering. Um, is that being done in-house or are you looking to um, get others on board to help with that design development? Yeah, so at the moment our um, transport modelling consultancy um, is uh, WSP. So we've worked with WSP on the feasibility work. Obviously, um, you know, we do need to progress um, route feasibility. So we've done high level studies, looking at various options, and then we're narrowing down to the to the first route. We need to take that forward. Um, and like I said, we are doing the surveys, which we've commissioned um, seven partnership to undertake. Um, so there are opportunities. I mean, we do have our professional services framework, but um, that the, the council are signed up to that we that we uh, work with. So, so we do, you, you know, generally we go through the framework um, for, for that kind of work, but um, not knowing off the top of my head when that's up for renewal, there might be opportunities for other companies to, to join up with the council. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question from Joan. Hi. I just wanted to query about wheelchair access. You did mention a uh, cleaning of platforms. Um, current bus stops, obviously the driver has to get off and use a ramp to allow wheel wheelchairs to get on and off. How would that work? 
the the vehicle is um, easily accessible in that it's it's designed to uh, be directly level with the curb, so it should it should meet the curb. I mean, so that you can you can transfer a, vi a wheelchair onto the vehicle easily without the need of a ramp. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any more questions from anyone in the audience? I can't see any more hands up. Oh yes, I've got a uh, uh, James. James Morshid. Hi. Yes. Um, just a question about batteries. The range was about uh, was it twenty kilometres? Yes. Yeah. Um, so what happens after twenty kilometres? I mean, does it stop at the end of the route and recharge, oh. or do you have interchange? Yes. Yeah, sorry. Yes. Yeah, so we we were planning to have charger charging infrastructure at the um, terminal. Um, so at one end at the rail station, um, obviously overnight in the depot facility yep. and at the other end at the university hospital. So um, with the battery, we expect in five years time when this is um, operational, we expect battery technology to have moved on significantly. So we expect the range to be even greater then. But that's what we're working with right now in 2020. Okay. Has it been looked at to, to possibly have um, swappable batteries? So that you can just change the, uh, you know, recharge it without downtime for the vehicle. Um, that's quite a technical question. I'd need to get back to a technical person at the <laughs> university. <Sorry. laughs> I, I should have um, started this question session uh, with a I'm a program manager, <laughs> right? But yeah, <laughs> um, I can find out. I can find out. We have a technical team, and obviously WMG have a centre of excellence in battery technology. Um, you know, it's one of the many good reasons to be working with them uh, on, on this project. So, James, if you I, wanted to, um, what, what I'll do is I'll, I'll have your email details and I'll share them with Nicola and then she can get back to you on that technical question, if that's OK. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, that's lovely. OK, thank, thank you. you. Um, are there any more questions? No more hands going up. I just had one, well, it's more of a query, Nicola. So you mentioned in your presentation about SMEs and their involvement um, and, and trying to keep much of it as local as possible. So um, is it OK to share your contact details through this webinar? Just because a lot of our target audience are SMEs and they'll be on this webinar now and, you know, may may want further further news about how they could get involved um because i know we were looking at one point um for the shelter when a local company to build the you know the shelter for the vlr and i don't know if you've got further forward with using a local company looking into that and um in terms of keeping uh, the economy yeah. local yeah yeah so with the shelter that you just yeah. mentioned we did we've got an options report we've pulled that together now we've put three um options and it needs to go through uh, the governance up to um, Council Road Boyle and uh, steering group, yeah. um, but they were all UK based. Yeah. So, and we, you know, we've included within that um, the commentary option. So um, then it, it has to go through the process. Um, I mean, there, there was another example of another project actually, um, just that we uh, put with Far UK. We applied funding for resilient glazing for safer passenger vehicle operation following the Sandylands accident in 2016 and we were successful with that as well so um, what I would say is it's definitely worth um, getting in contact quite often I would put um, businesses in touch with either WMG or with TDI um, because they, they're really in control of the supply chain we, we contract with WMG and then they deliver the product but for future bids it is um, collaborating with us. I mean, I do get quite a few inquiries through my my LinkedIn account and you're welcome to add me to your network. Yeah. Um, and any, any innovative ideas that companies present to me, I always progress, um, follow up with the right people. And now I should just say that the Innovation Centre in Dudley, whilst it is work in progress and it's currently under construction, they do act have the legal entity um, set up now so since 
our team of five there. So that it's the Black Country Innovative Manufacturing Organization, and they'll be looking for um, companies to work with to develop that that centre won't just be about very light rail. It will be about innovative home to hub transport solutions. So um, there'll be opportunities um, in Dudley as well as Coventry. OK, thank you. Um, we have had one more question coming into the chat function, actually, asking, will it link Steichel to the paramedic station, which is near the Rico Arena? Because obviously um, it would be good for people who need to get there. So would that be something you mentioned about it will open up to the Rico Arena later yeah. on in the development, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, we've still got quite a lot of work to do on the network development plan. I mean, what I showed you with the Cloverleaf um, idea, that's, you know, that that's our aspiration, but we need to do quite a bit more feasibility work to look at how those loops actually work in in reality, whether they'll yield sufficient patronage demand to justify the investment costs. So that's the aspiration. There's, there is a lot of work to do to actually make the network a reality. Um, but what we do know from previous systems is once you've got your first route in place, you know, all of those systems, Manchester, Nottingham, get Edinburgh. The first route is always the hardest, but once it's up and running, it kind of follows and the, the funding follows to develop it. So we just got to keep going, make sure we achieve um, the proof of concept, um, get this first route in the ground, and then hopefully Coventry will see um, a network that will serve all the strategic locations um, required to have an attractive public transport system for the city. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nicola. I think I think that's all the questions now. So thank you very much for uh, sharing the presentation today. It's very informative. Um, I'm going to uh, do my presentation now on the Green Business Programme. So thank you, Nicola. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you all for listening. Thanks. Thank you. So those of you who want to stay, um, I'm Denise Osborne, so I'm a marketing and events coordinator for the Green Business Programme. Um, those of you who don't know, the Green Business Programme, it's um, an ERDF supported funding programme for SMEs based in Coventry and Warwickshire. And our main aim is to help local businesses become much more energy and resource efficient, um, making the most of low carbon opportunities that are out there. Um, just to clarify an SME, so you have to be a business that employs fewer than 250 employees, have an annual turnover not exceeding 50 million euros. And the other criteria is that at least 50% of your sales have to be made through B2B. So we can't help 100% consumer um, outlet, but we can help um, business to business if it's 50% or more. Um, we've been running since 2016 and we've got some great highlights um, of what we've been doing in the local area to reduce the impact on the environment. Um, we've supported to date 240 local companies since the programme launched and one of our key outputs is um, reducing CO2 emissions um, and we've saved 13,000 tonnes to date and that's growing all the time. We've provided over 2.78 million um, in grant funding to support these businesses. And um, by providing this funding, it creates job opportunities within our local economy as well. Um, and we've created something like 60 new jobs in these SMEs. Um, and part of the network, which um, which these webinars are part of some of the benefits of the network, we've now got um, 1,195 organisations that have joined our network. Um, phase two of our programme started in 2019 um, and he's running until 2021 um, and the grants, just an example of the grants, we give out um, a minimum of £1,000 up to a maximum of £50,000 to businesses. So um, we provide 40% of the funding and the business would invest 60%. Part of the um, program is a free um, energy audit. Um, so um, the team will go into the business and help identify where savings can be made in energy, water and waste. Um, there'd be continued free membership to the Green Business Network. So all organisations in the locality can become a member of the Green Business Network. You don't just have to be an SME. Um, and that's a resource there like the webinars today, face-to-face -face events. Um, being able to go out and find out what legislation is available. 
Um, we also provide um, workshops and one to one support. We had some good news about six months ago that our programme has been extended to June 2023. So we've got additional 1.14 million grant funding from the ERDF. Um, and all of this is being delivered by the, ourselves, the council and Coventry University Enterprises. Just a bit on the energy audits. Um, the team of energy advisors will go into um, a business and they'll look at the fabric of the building um, and they will also look at any capital costs as well where savings can be made. If, if a business wanted to, for example, invest in solar PV, what will the payback um, period be? Um, and, from, and from this detailed um, energy audit, the team will then put a report together for the business. And that, that is actually 12 hours work and it costs the business nothing. So even if you're, a business doesn't decide to pursue a grant, it has still got that energy efficiency report to look at for maybe future considerations. Um, and especially in the current climate where businesses are looking where efficiencies can be saved, it is a really useful piece of work. Um, obviously, with COVID, um, it stopped us going out to businesses, but that hasn't stopped us um, still producing the reports um, and the energy audits. We now do them remotely. Um, we, we've adapted um, very efficiently to um, the new process of working. So our energy advisors can work with your business remotely via online teams like this um, um, software we use at the moment. And all a business needs to do is send us their bills, their photos, videos that they're building. Um, there's a handy guide on our website of how that can work. Um, and it is working because today we've completed about 22 remote energy audits for businesses. Um, in terms of the grants itself, I've mentioned the value of the grants. Um, one of the key outputs is, um, one of the key outputs is that um, you have to, as a business, save one tonne of CO2 emissions per thousand pounds of grant that's given out. So that's one of our um, outputs we have to achieve. Sorts of things that can be supported. Typical measures um, that we work with are LED lighting for businesses, looking at insulating the building more efficiently. Um, new equipment, if it's a highly intensive manufacturing business, we'll go in and um, look at um, investing in new energy efficient equipment. Um, renewable technologies, I've mentioned, I've mentioned solar, um, better ventilation, refrigeration, um, recycling and waste, um, balers and crushers, all those sorts of um, initiatives. I've talked a bit about the Green Business Network, so I will skip on to the next slide. Just on that, though, we do also produce a monthly newsletter. So when you're part of the network, you'll get this newsletter, which will tell you about all our upcoming events, any new legislation, and also case studies of businesses that we've helped in the area. Um, and we also help you signpost to other to other grants as well. So we have other programmes within Coventry City Council that help businesses, including business support, innovation and skills for growth. Um, oh, oh, could you mute yourself, please. Oh, yeah. I'll mute you. There you go. Um, and also we have uh, the Green Business Directory as well, which provides um, opportunities for businesses to list what they technology. We'll put your directory free and then we go when we go out to businesses, we'll signpost people to go and have a look at that directory and um, to see what um, businesses in the local area can offer in terms of green technology. Just some of our upcoming events. Um, um, people may be aware that the Green Homes Grant's now been launched by the government where it's going to be a big programme going out um, to residents to retrofit their homes um, to make them more um, energy efficient. Um, we're going to be running a webinar on that uh, very shortly and within the next month so details will follow on that. Um, obviously, today's event was on the very light rail and we're looking at doing an event in November on the public realm. Um, we work very closely with Coventry University Enterprises um, and um, they, they have grant system as well. So revenue grants up to 10K with the same 40% intervention rate. So they're in development of low carbon products. Um, they'll go in and um, 
uh, give grants out to um, businesses that are looking at prototype designs um, and manufacturing for new technologies as well. For example, they've given a grant out for um, software application development for an app that looks at how you can promote car sharing, etc. That's the sorts of grants they give out. Um, they also have capital grants up to 20k um, looking at um, it's supporting activities around equipment to manufacture low carbon products um, and looking at ways of um, recycling and um, waste processing as well. And they also run workshops like this. Um, their workshops are much more in depth and probably run for um, a whole day around building technologies um, around passive house design, um, sustainable refurbishment and how to um, make um, more efficiencies within your offices and your building complexes. Another um, environmental service offered by Coventry City Council, oh, somebody's moving my slides, uh, I'll just go back there, um, is our business sustain division. So that's a team of sustainability consultants based within Coventry City Council. And it provides national businesses, so not just Coventry and Warwickshire, all sizes, so not just SMEs, with environmental management assistance. So they provide bespoke regis uh, registers of environmental and also health and safety legislation, informing clients of the laws that need to be um, compiled with. Um, they also conduct confidential site-specific environmental legislation. Um, compliance audits um, and they're supporting clients to maintain ISO 14001 standards and they'll do this through training, mentoring staff and mentoring new environmental managers as well. So um, the contact details are there if any businesses want to find out more. Just a bit on our own climate change strategy. So obviously um, the government's announced its net zero commitment by 2050. Our current strategy was published in 2012 um, and we had a target to reduce carbon dioxide emissions by 27.5%. We actually achieved that in 2014, six years early, but we know we can't stop there. We're producing, we're currently in the development of producing a new climate change strategy for the city as the current one ends at the end of this year. So that's now all under review. Um, we've got um, Head of Climate Change and Sustainability now, Brett Willis is overseeing this work, so he's busy working on engaging with businesses, communities um, and the council on where our strategy is going to be going over the next 10 years um, and it will ensure that we are at the forefront of low carbon innovation. Um, just to give you um, some context to that, out of the 20 largest cities in England, Coventry is ranked seventh for its reduction in emissions, but we know that we can't stop there and there's a lot, there's a lot more to do. Um, the city's also been recognised as a global leader on um, carbon um, climate action um, through the Carbon Disclosure Programme. Um, so we've achieved a place on the CDP Cities A list, which uh, proves our commitment to tackling climate change. Um, we are only one of four UK cities to be on that list alongside London, Bournemouth and, um, and Leicester. So um, that to score an A, a city must have a citywide emissions inventory and have set a reduction target as well. So we've produced our climate action plan and we've been recognised for that work um, going forward. We're going to be um, continuing with that strategy. Um, here is the UK Battery Industrialisation Centre, which Nicola briefly spoke about. So this is an innovative partnership between um, Coventry City Council, the LEP and the Warwick Manufacturing Group. So um, the UK BIC is an open access research facility, which is supporting the transition of the UK to become a world leader in um, design, development and manufacture of batteries for vehicle electrification. Um, this is um, this has been built in Coventry, so um, we'll be at the forefront of the battery technology for electric vehicles. Um, just a bit more on our emissions across the city. I won't talk about the very light rail, that's obviously been covered, but um, EV charging. So Coventry now has 178 charge points um, and I believe 130 have been installed um, in September as well. So. Um, to put that into context, we are third with the most amount of EV charges of all UK cities outside London, um, and that's growing all the time. Um, we obviously, um, one of the cities that was chosen as an e-scooter trial, I know that's been put on hold for the time being, but that will be um, reinvented in the future and reintroduced. 
um, heat line. So several buildings in the city are heated by heat line, including the council buildings, the cathedral and um, the new wave water park. And that's 6.6 .6 kilometres of buried pipes that brings waste heat from the waste to energy plant to the city centre. So that's saving approximately 1100 CO2s per year compared to typical um, buildings using um, gas boilers. We also have energy efficient street lighting. So that's been going since 2015. So all our lighting has been replaced with this. Um, this is centrally controlled dimming and it saves the council about 5,000 tonnes of CO2 a year. Uh, well, no, to date, sorry, to date that has been. Um, also, the electric buses, I believe, have now gone live. I think they went live last month. So the council received 2.2 million of government funding to invest in greener, cleaner buses for the city. I believe there are nine now fully electric buses in collaboration with National Express. And they're on the major routes that we feel are the air quality hotspots in the city. Um, and we've also launched a go electric taxi scheme where we're trying to encourage drivers to move to electric vehicles as well. And we give incentives um, worth about £2,700 to taxi drivers to make the switch to a cleaner vehicle. Um, just on this slide, so this is um, our Rezo project, um, which is um, basically to make sure the city becomes um, zero carbon by a certain certain date. Um, and we're working, um, one of the cities, we were working for the local smart energy project. So this project's working with partners, um, the WMCA, University of Warwick, um, designing this regional energy system operator. So this will help the city to decarbonise and keep costs down. So this design project has the potential to attract further investment into the city and reduce the need for expensive infrastructure upgrades. Um, we have a stakeholder engagement manager now who's um, overseeing this project and her role is to form partnerships and engage with regional businesses um, to, 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 to capitalise on how we get to net zero in the future. Um, the council is also undertaking a feasibility study on renewable heat recovery systems, looking at the um, sewer and historic mine infrastructure within Coventry. So we can't just rely on electricity. We have to look at other sources as well. Um, Coventry City Council has also partnered up with EO Charging um, for purchasing and installing the EV chargers. Um, there's grants available to organisations to install EV chargers at their premises as well. Um, so if you want to find out more about there, that, there's a, um, a link there, plugincoventry.org. Um, if you've got a car park within your, um, within your business premises, you could look at having these installed at no cost to yourselves um, and um, providing, you know, electrical vehicle infrastructure within your business. Um, Transport for West Midlands as well have launched their cycle parking for organisations to encourage more people to use their bikes. Um, this is actually coming to an end at the end of this month. So do get in there if you want some free bike racks installed at your business to encourage more cycling amongst your staff. Here's some of the key players in Coventry that we're going to be working with on our climate change strategy. So um, lots of key businesses in, in, in the city. Um, obviously, the two universities we want to engage with schools and colleges. Um, the utility companies, Seven Trend and Eon, are, are based in Coventry. Um, we'll also be working closely with our transport networks, the automotive in industry as well. And also we're working more closely now with housing um, providers as well, especially now that the Green Homes Grant has been launched. Um, and then just, just to end up, just to give you an example of some case studies of businesses that we have helped. This is a business based in Warwick, 3P Innovation. They invested a lot of money, um, 395K to um, reduce their carbon emissions. They got a 69K grant from us. I'll just point out this was during phase one of our programme when the grants went up to 100K. Now they're 50K grants, but they fell into the phase one category. Um, and what they did with that is they um, installed LED lighting throughout. 
um, air conditioning systems, um, compressors and installation of solar panels on their roof. And they're estimating they're saving 153 tonnes of CO2 emissions per year. So obviously that's um, not only helping the environment, but it's obviously reducing their energy bills by a lot. Um, Sargentson's another local company based in Coventry. They were spending 370k on um, their electricity and gas bills. They're highly intensive manufacturing um, company because they're doing aluminium die casting. They got a 26 grant from us. Um, they bought two new uh, gas furnaces, which were more energy efficient. Um, they had LED lighting throughout and power factor correction. Um, by investing that money, they paid it back within um, one and a half years. Um, the saving, as you can see, a lot of um, CO2, 335, but their money they're saving on their energy bills is they estimate they save now about 50k per year in energy bills. And one last case study, Technoset, so they're based in rugby, engineering again, um, they wanted to make their premises more eco-friendly and save money on bills. They got um, a 47k grant from us um, after they themselves invested 117 as the other businesses, LED lighting um, was put out into both their factories. They got two factories. They also extended the heat in uh, ducting from their factory two into factory one because there was no heating in factory one. So um, they spent money on sorting that out. Um, <clears throat> they had a, a shut off switch on their roller shutter door as well. So it was much more efficient. So um, heat wasn't escaping so quickly. And um, they invested in a new cleaning machine as well. So they're anticipating um, their energy bills will drop by 33% um, and they're reducing 62 CO2, CO2 emissions per year. Um, so for any businesses that want or haven't had an energy audit and would like an energy audit, please do get in contact with us. There are contact details. Um, do follow us on Twitter, join our LinkedIn group because we put daily news on there, what we're doing, what we're up to. Um, so um, I hope that's um, given you some insight in terms of what we're doing in Coventry and Warwickshire to help businesses um, with grant funding and reduce CO2 emissions in the area. Does anyone have any questions? And you notice there was one question in the chat function. We've finished on time today because uh, normally we overrun, which is which is a good sign. Thank you to all those that did stay to listen to the Green Business Pro because I know most people are more interested in the very light rail. Um, just thank you everyone for joining us and supporting these um, Green Talk Live webinars. We've had to obviously switch to webinars um, because we can't do face to face events at the moment. Um, they've proved really popular. We've had good numbers on them. So thanks for supporting them. Um, if you do have any questions, do email the Green Business team. We're always happy to help. Stay engaged with us. Um, we want to help businesses in the area. Um, and also, please um, remember that we will be sharing all these slides out with you after the event, including the recording as well, so you can re-watch it on demand. Um, and we look forward to seeing you in the next Green Talk Live webinar, which will be next month on public round work that's happening in the city. Okay. All right, I'll say bye to everyone then. All right then, bye.